Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 138. Well, it's the end of 2022, and it's been another year of changes at Real Python. The Real Python team has written, edited, curated, illustrated, and produced a mountain of Python material this year. We added some new members to the team, updated the site's features, and created new styles of tutorials and video courses. Three members of the Real Python team joined me this week Kate Finnegan, Gerana Yella, and Leodanas Pozo Ramos. We wanted to share a year end wrap up with tutorials, step by step projects, and video courses that showcase what our team created this year. Kate and Gerana helped to shepherd articles through the multi stage editing process. Along with the rest of the team, they make sure these resources impart crucial Python knowledge and provide a thorough didactic experience. Leodanas' name has been featured many times on this podcast, and it was great to talk to him about writing tutorials and diving deep into the Pythonic details. We hope you enjoyed this review. Programming note, there won't be an episode next week, but we will be back in January and look forward to bringing you a year full of great guests, articles, and topics. This episode is brought to you by Telemetry Hub. Telemetry Hub by Scout APM is observability made affordable. Monitor and debug your systems without breaking the bank. Get a free trial at telemetryhub.com. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Garano, welcome back. Thank you. Always fun to hang out for a while. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here at our year-end sort of article slash video course wrap-up, content wrap-up, I don't know what else to call it. And we've brought some additional guests here this year to talk about not only the changes at RealPython, but kind of celebrate all of the people that contribute to RealPython. And one of the first people I want to bring on is uh, Kate Finnegan. Thanks for coming on the show. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Chris. The other person that I've wanted to have on the show for a long time, and we, we had some challenges in trying to do that, is his name has come up many times on the show, is Leodanas Pozo Ramos. Hi, Chris. Hey. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're very excited to have you both come on the show. Uh, maybe people could be reminded about some of the stuff that you do at Real Python Girana. Yeah, of course. So... I've been now, for, for the last year, I've been working full-time with Real Python, and uh, my main position is still a content creator, so I'm making uh, or creating articles. But I also work sort of like keeping an overview of, of all the articles we're doing and, and trying to come up with ways in which we can cover all you re readers' needs as best as possible. So all the articles I'm kind of reading them uh, at, at the end to kind of keep an overview of what everyone else is doing and... Uh, those, those kind of things. Do you think your that position will change somewhat over the next year? So, so one of the exciting things that are happening right as we speak is that we've hired a a new person on the team that's more like a pro project manager. So some of the things I've been doing in terms of, I guess, project managing uh, all our articles might might change around a little bit. Yeah, me too. I do a lot of that in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that'll be fun to see how, how that works out. But I also hope now that I've kind of had a year to, to kind of settle in a little bit more and look more into, say, what we call the content direction part of the role, where we're kind of looking even more consciously as which things we want to cover uh, for people. And we have a, we have some learning paths on the site that we want to really upgrade and, and things like this. So, so there's definitely potential for, for new things to do and, and stuff to improve. I guess. Awesome. Kate, what, what is it that, if you were to describe to the listeners what you do at RealPython? Yeah, so my official title is tutorial editor. So I guess I'm kind of like Girarna in the sense that a lot of my job happens sort of at the end of the article pipeline, as we call it. I'm sort of the the person who's there at the end to make sure that after everything is technically sound, 
we're making sure that it's a quality piece of educational writing. Yeah. So I look at the didactic elements. I look for spots where I'm like, okay, I have a question. So maybe someone else (laughs) will have a question. (laughs) And then I also, you know, am the comma queen and make sure that every little T is crossed and I is dotted at the end. So that's what I do on the article side. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that you've been helping me out as a last sort of pass over what I've kind of been creating as show notes for the podcast. Oh, yeah. We put a lot of effort into them. And so I, I appreciate you combing through them and making sure, <laughs> comma wise and everything, that they look good too. Yep. <laughs> yep. And that's been super fun. And I also take care of updating our internal links when we publish a new tutorial or video course, just making sure that that resource is discoverable across our entire suite of offerings, including the podcast show notes. So that's been fun too. It's always fun to go in and be like, oh, what's Chris been up to? <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I'm I'm finding podcasts from years ago, which is always really exciting. Yeah. And then you helped me also with the video courses. Exactly. We were tag teaming for a while, helping to kind of create and get them all set up inside the content management system, but you've been actually taking over a lot of that work lately. Yeah. And again, that's something that is just super fun. A lot of times the video courses are based on tutorials that I have recently edited. So it's cool to see how the instructors put their own spin on on showing the tools that we are highlighting in our tutorials and the processes. So yeah, I put those in the content management system and I also um, generate the transcripts and then edit those and make sure that they are accurate and readable. And again, um, look for links that allow the viewer to continue their Python journey. Yeah, it's been great. You've been kind of uh, sort of on the side learning Python as you go, which has been yep. kind of probably <laughs> pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I don't uh, I don't have a development background, um but one of the things that's helped me learn quite a bit is that I've also taken over developing quizzes. Yeah. Going in and trying to pull out what are the key takeaways from this tutorial or video course and then building a quiz out of those. Yeah, it's been a bit of a focus lately to try to get more of that sort of stuff on the site. Yeah. Help people kind of test their knowledge. Yeah, I think it's really helpful. So, late on, how long have you been with Real Python? How long have you been writing for us? Oh, that's that's a good question. <laughs> I guess that I I've been working full time for Real Python for a couple of years, but I started freelancing for writing some articles here and there at the end of 2018. Okay, I guess. Yeah, uh, it's been a long journey until now. I've learned a lot on the process because. English is my second language, and I have to. I, I've been learning a lot of English in the process, so <laughs> and also a lot of a lot of Python. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah. You're you're known for the deep dives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I I kind of write my articles from the self taught perspective, just because I want uh, to understand all the details myself. So I I run a deep research for every article and that's how i i kind of find all these little pieces of <laughs> <laughs> of information yeah that's cool i feel the same way that i feel that we're uh, kindred spirits in that way having been mostly self-taught and kind of digging in and i feel like that's a lot of our audience too really appreciates that yeah yeah i i, I guess a really good approach for writing for mostly for beginners we have a lot of uh, content for beginners on the site. So this is kind of a good way for writing topics for beginners, I guess. Yeah, totally. We wanted to discuss some of the big changes that we've made over the last year, big and small, I guess. Some of them are completely new and then some are refinements. Do anybody want to take off on that? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about um, sort of like some some of the things that's happening in the background, so to speak. Sure. So we, we have our pipeline, as uh, Kate mentioned, um, where where we have a fairly the huge system for kind of f- following up the articles and making sure they get reviewed at different stages and things like this. Tra- traditionally, so I think. Dan took over Real Python about five years ago now, and in the beginning, all the articles were written by freelancers, and that's how both me and uh, Ledan is kind of started writing for the site. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so, so then the, the the setup on the pipeline was very much tailed towards people who are then just working on on the articles a few hours here and there. Uh, but now, over the last year, we've been having a lot of content that is created by people working full time. Yeah. So, so we we've been able to kind of move over to having a much more, say, synchronous way of working together. Uh, so, so there's a lot of the processes that we've been able to simplify. So the reviews and things like this have been much more efficient. And that's kind of been an iterative process where we kind of needed to to look into, okay, we're doing this. Why are we doing this again? <laughs> <laughs> is there something we can kind of simplify? Is this kind of just because, well, it was set up to, to kind of handle different time zones or different uh, hours of working and some people only being able to contribute during weekends and all those kind of things. So, so that's been a lot of fun too. To kind of just f- figure out how we can do things more, yeah, optimally in a sense. I think we mentioned the idea of having more people as sort of what we're terming internally core team members working full time on it. And laid on us, you're definitely one of those people that are working full time on it. And yep. I was brought on full time right about the time I started doing the show. <laughs> <laughs> And Kate was hired, you're, you came in in January, is that right? Uh, last December. Last December, okay, so it's yep. a, a whole year now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've been working on some new types of articles and new types of video courses. One, I'll mention one of them that I was, uh, I've mentioned a couple times on the show that we have this new format for video courses called a Code Conversation, which was really championed by Martin Broyce him kind of in conversation with Ian Curry, who we'll talk about a little bit as we go through, and Philip Iskani. And they kind of had this idea of how about we have something that's less formal, that is a majority of our video courses are based upon existing tutorials, and as Kate mentioned, and so it's kind of like another pass at them. And some people learn better through video or through audio and that kind of presentation of material. And having a second person also present the materials. It's a great way of learning also. This code conversation idea, though, is very different where it could be a question or a conversation like the one that Gerarna and Ian had recently that I talked about on the show, the one about PyPodrick Tommel and packaging your code. I was (laughs) such a naysayer initially about it and kind of (laughs) uh, very on the other side, like, well, is this going to work? How's this going to work? And, you know, I've been definitely proven wrong and I'm I'm a big fan of them. And um, I'll talk about them a little more as we go into the content here. Mm -hmm. But one of the other things that we've been revising is the step-by-step projects. What's some of the things that you guys have discussed and thought about making them a little more structured? Leidonis, can you talk about it? Yeah, basically, I've, I've written a couple of, of these project-based articles. I, I I guess it's a good way to teach people how to do some, uh, how to finish a project completely, because uh, some people start learning and then they jump into projects, and this is a good way to combine different knowledge and skills in, in a single article. Yeah. Typically, we try to show a single way to do things, when we approach a given project and we try to guide the user into logical steps to finish the project and get a fully functional application or library or something like that that we have a couple of examples on the on the side so i guess this is a, a really good format for people who are trying to get into the next step in their learning of python yeah, I definitely think so. We feature quite a few of them as video courses. And so that's my chance to kind of go over them again. And I really enjoy the process, kind of moving beyond the basics and applying some of your knowledge. Yeah, I guess one of the main features or the most exciting things that you find in this kind of article is that we always try to have something functional after every step. We will have uh, some reward. After every, <laughs> after finishing every step. So this is, I guess this is kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. Even if you are not able to finish the complete article or the project, you, you will have some, you know, some rewards in the, in the road. Yeah, nice. Karen, are there other things you wanted to highlight as far as uh, changes over the last year? 
Yes, so there's also a couple of um, really new article types that we've been experimenting with. Okay. And uh, I think kind of traditionally, real, real Python articles, what we've really been good at and doing a lot are these really in-depth explorations of sometimes fairly small topics. These are, uh, I really both enjoy writing these and I enjoy reading them and they're, they're kind of great for really looking at all the details as Ledanis was talking about earlier. But sometimes that there are kind of topics to cover which are are smaller, um, even though we, we usually are able to find ways to really dive deep. <laughs> but we, we tried uh, some years ago, we tried to kind of see, can, can we write some of these shorter articles that can be kind of more effective for the reader, just get in, get some knowledge and, and move on? The pit stop format or whatever. Right, we had something we call the pit stop format. And these, we, we really struggled to make this work. And uh, if uh, I, I can share kind of my, my first uh, first time I met Leodanis, I was actually working as a outline reviewer uh, with Real Python. So I was kind of reading all the outlines that we had. And one of the things we had proposed to do a pit stop on was something uh, just about how do you iterate over dictionaries, which sounds like a really tiny thing. Yeah. And Leodanis came along with an outline that was already a couple of thousand words. And I think, okay, <laughs> we can probably <laughs> uh, we can probably do something about this as well. And it's a fantastic article. It kind of turned out to be, but it's uh, it, it kind of showed us a little bit that just thinking about the topic that's small is not really the way to think about how to to write a two-to-point article because e- e- any topic, you, you can really dive deep into it. Yeah, in a previous life, I did a PhD in math and that was all about just finding a tiny, tiny little topic and just digging your way as deep into it as you can. Owning it. <laughs> Owning it, <laughs> yes. Um, so, so what we've kind of been looking for now is, okay, how can we be able to create these kind of more to-the-point articles uh, in, in a way that's good both for, for, for our readers, but also limit the scope. And we kind of figured out the topic is not the way to limit the scope. It's more about how do we approach the topic. Oh, okay. So uh, we have a couple of uh, kind of different styles that we're experimenting with. One we call just a question and answer uh, article. So we kind of just look at one specific question and see how can we answer this sort of like very concisely. We'll talk about an example of this later. And then we have something we call the how-to articles, which are just about how to how do you do one tiny thing. And it's kind of related to the step-by-step projects, but it's it's much more... Uh, contained to just how do you do one thing, not how do you build a full project. And then we've also been trying out a little bit now something we've at least internally just been calling showcase articles, where we, instead of going in-depth into into something, we kind of just want to showcase something that's out there. So what, a recent one was one that Martin Martin Broyce did about the dull E, uh, so, so this um, artificial intelligence that can create uh, pictures yeah. um, or images. So, so instead of kind of showing everything that's possible, uh, like we might do in our typical tutorials, we kind of just show how, how do you get started with this thing and how can you play with it and kind of just get you up and running. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to just experiment with these and, and see how, how do they fare with people. And, and some of the viewership we see for these is really good. At the same time, we also get a lot of feedback that People really love our deep dives, uh, so <laughs> those are definitely not going away. <laughs> okay, uh, that, that will definitely stay with us. But uh, but it's also fun, yeah, to just try a, a few different things and then figure out the, the key takeaways from those. Nice. Well, I brought everybody here, and thanks for coming to discuss some of the stuff that we want to champion over the year. We're not going to say these are the best articles or the, you know, that sort of thing. It's more of stuff that we want to highlight that we liked out of the stuff being created by everybody in the real Python team and our outside contributors and everything and kind of showcase some of it and stuff that we're excited about. And so I thought we could start. Kate, do you want to go first here? Yeah. So the first tutorial that I want to highlight is called Your Python Coding Environment on Windows. And it's a setup guide by Ian Curry, who is a core RealPython team member and who was really instrumental in kicking off and developing a few of those different styles of tutorials yeah, this year. definitely. Especially the how-to and Q&A formats. So that's one claim to fame. His other claim to fame on the team is being our resident Windows guru. Yeah. And so (laughs) this tutorial is really great because it gives you a full step-by-step guide to setting up 
a flexible, all-purpose Windows environment for Python coding. It's really great for beginner and intermediate Python programmers. Either you're a Windows user just getting into Python, or maybe you are a seasoned Python developer who uses Mac OS and Linux and wants to try out a Windows machine without getting mired in all the options. Yeah, you might have gotten uh, issued one at work. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. right. And so now you're like, all right, what do I do with this thing? <laughs> all right, totally. <laughs> um, there are so many programs that I could use to do basic things like installing programs and like, why does it keep auto restarting? And, you know, how do I get rid of OneDrive? And so like every question or gripe that you might have about your new Windows machine um, or about learning to code Python on your trusty old Windows computer, Ian answers those questions and really walks you through from the very start. Like, let's say you have a fresh Windows installation. Um, what are the first things that you're going to do? So it's a really great tutorial for a lot of reasons. One thing I really like about it is that start from scratch element. You know, he walks you through setting up a command line interface, installing software via package managers, configuring all the essential Windows settings for a Python coding setup. I could see a tutorial on this topic kind of reading like a buffet of options, you know, like, yeah. all right, um, you want to install software via package managers. Here are 10 options <laughs> for how to do that. Yeah. Which is hard because then you don't have an opinion to, exactly. to base it around. Yeah, exactly. So what sets this apart, I think, is that Ian acknowledges that there are several options, but then he walks you through one flexible setup that will work for most programmers' needs. Yeah, and the the resources that he is giving you are primarily, or I think, yeah, they're primarily open source, but they're all free. Yeah. So that's that's fantastic. There's no kind of financial barrier to anything that he's suggesting. Yeah, he says you won't get to know all the possible tools, but you'll walk away with one setup that should be flexible enough for most situations. Yeah. So that's great. Now, it's a very long tutorial. And if you walk through it with him, you'll be restarting your machine several times. He says, like, have this tutorial on another machine <laughs> because you're going to be restarting this one. All right. But you might also have a situation where you just need a quick and dirty setup that's going to work right now. So after he walks you through this full, you know, step-by-step -step setup, he also has a section at the end where he fast tracks the setup. So you can really spend as much or as little time on this as you like, depending on, you know, why you're suddenly diving into Windows or Python and what you're going to be using the setup for. Yeah, I featured this, uh, I can't remember which episode, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link to it, and I talked about it myself, and as a uh, sometimes Windows user, <laughs> um, <laughs> either by having it at a, a work sort of situation, or having to consult other people with them, or in, often with the video courses, having to review them, having to have sort of a Windows setup to test things on. It was very handy and uh, learned a lot about chocolatey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a fantastic tool. <laughs> yeah, it was very fun. Telemetry Hub is an observability tool that collects all your complex telemetry data into a single pane of glass for you to view by leveraging the power of open telemetry. Telemetry Hub is the one-stop shop for all your logs, metrics, and tracing data. This lightweight, full-stack observability tool provides reliable transparency into your distributed system without per-seat pricing or a complex deployment process. Telemetry Hub by Scout APM. Get a free trial at telemetryhub.com. That's T-E-L-E-M-E-T-R-Y-H-U-B.com. Garen, what's your first one? It's also one that Ian has been writing. And um, I'll before I dive into the article, I'll also kind of note, uh, somewhat related to the Windows article, one, one of the other kind of new things we have on the site this year is, is um, this platform switcher, which is just oh, an, yeah. an element in the articles uh, where you can kind of... Yeah, for the code and uh, right. terminal. Yeah. So you can, you can see your 
typical it's the console things on, on different platforms so how would it look on windows how would it look on mac how would it look on linux and this is also something that uh, i know ian was a big proponent of it kind of came out a little bit of, of the work he's been doing on the windows guide and things like this and uh, what it has kind of enabled us to do is is to be i guess uh, more yeah friendly to everyone i hope because uh, in, in uh, the earlier articles typically whatever you saw it, it was it was quite often the, the linux version and then if you were on windows you kind of need to translate yourself how, how it would work sure <laughs> so, so with this we were at least more conscious now to to try to include instructions on all platforms and and we have a this handy ui element to, to do it for, for the first article i chosen one that we called why is it important to close files in python and uh, it, it it was the first we published of, of this new series I was talking about, about this uh, shorter, more spe- specific articles. It was one that Ian wrote, and I think we published it back in April, around the time of PyCon. And the idea of this article is just that we, we kind of want to look at at the why. Uh, of uh, Typically, if, if you're starting working with files with Python, you're told that you should always open them with this with open statement. And uh, often it's just said that that's how you should do it, and then not really digging into the details of why. Right. So, so what we wanted to do here was kind of explore, well, why should you do that? And, and kind of give give an explanation to people who are potentially just learning about Python and, and see how it interplays with, with the operating system and, and learn a little bit of those details. And for this one, I was uh, I was a reviewer for the articles. I was uh, sitting a bit with Ian and we were kind of exp- exploring all the different, yeah, what, what happens when you don't close files. And... Uh, and kind of the interesting answer is that usually nothing bad happens if you don't close your files. It, it will probably still work because Python kind of has a lot of this these features to kind of take care of closing files. So the, the answer is kind of the operating system is handling your files. Yeah. So then Python communicates to your operating system and it usually works out fine. So, so in a sense, you, you don't need to, to close your files explicitly. It will kind of clean up itself when your script ends or, or things like this. Now, the, the reason that you should still actually use your with open uh, to, to open your files, because that will automatically close your files when you stop uh, referring to them, is that if something bad happens, it's almost impossible to debug. So by doing these with opens, you're kind of pr- protecting yourself from that bad thing potentially happening. Because... When things can go wrong, it, it will be things like your, your file system runs out of open file handles. And that will happen if you have, depends again on the platform, but thousands and thousands of files open. So usually that's not the problem in your regular scripts. But if you, for instance, have a script that's kind of running for a long time or a process that's running for a long time, and it's kind of leaking these file handles, then you might run into trouble. But then you would just get a random error after your script has been running for a week and there's kind of no indication on, on why this happens. So kind of just to protect yourself from really these head-scratching errors that may show up later, if you just always close your files, that so there is no issue. Yeah. So so I think that this was a very nice example of kind of taking something that is usually not really covered well in uh, tutorials and definitely not in our uh, file tutorials. We kind of just say, do this without really digging into the why. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it was a question that, kind of it's nice to have an answer for it and it was also kind of some, something that we could go quite, quite narrowly and just say okay what we're doing in this article is kind of answering this question we're not diving into all the other things you could think about with uh, with opening files and things like this awesome so lay us what's your first one you wanted to talk about well my first one is an article that is really well written and very detailed it's about tomo files and uh, the article is titled Python and Tomal, new best friends, and is and the author is our friend Gerarne Yeller here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> this this article is is kind of a it covers a kind of an interesting topic because this topic of Tomal files is the future of how to build a project in Python. The article is intended to be useful for intermediate Python developers who are comfortable with uh, data structures and data types in Python and wanted to uh, dive into the TOML file format. This TOML file format is, is named after the authored name, which is Tom Preston Webner, and 
the format is thought to be used to be used as a configuration file. The article covers many topics about how to read and write TOML files using different libraries. One of these uh, libraries is a TOMLib module, which is in the uh, standard library for Python 3.11. So as I mentioned, this article dives into one of the formats that will be defined in the future of building your, your Python projects. Yeah, we talked about it quite a bit with the, the code conversation that, that Gerarna had with Ian, where they were talking about the TOML file being used there. Yeah. In this case, it's diving really deep into it as a, almost like a data format, like you said. Gerarna, what were some of the things that you wanted to highlight about the TOML format? Yes, as I kind of realized, I'm, I'm a total TOML format fanboy, I've kind of realized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I think I was just searching TOML on our site, and I think the five top hits are all articles I've written, so it kind of <laughs> ended up being kind of my thing. <laughs> Maybe it should be titled uh, Gerarna and TOML, New Best Friends. Yes, <laughs> New Best Friends. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, no, so, so what I really enjoy with the format is that it's it's very flexible. And it's easy to write by hand. So, so it works very well as a configuration file format, as opposed to things like JSON, where you kind of need to make sure all your brackets are kind of matching and things like this. And it supports nice things like like comments and, and so on, which you can't really use in JSON. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so it, it, it kind of has a different use case. Uh, so while JSON is fantastic for say, data transfer, those kind of things. It has been used a lot for configuration, which it's really not that great at. So, so kind of having a format that's dedicated to configuration, I think, helps a lot with just using configuration files. The one thing that you mentioned there is this TOML kit. Yeah, so TOML kit is a library for working with TOML files. So, so it's kind of something you can use to, say, programmatically maybe create a PyProject TOML. And it, it's actually, uh, the, the library itself is, is written by the same people who, who've written Poetry, uh, which is one of the libraries that, that really uses PyProject TOML. So, so it was really written to be able to handle those uh, PyProject TOML files. And one of the, the big challenges that TOMLKit solves is that it's able to, to change files while keeping things like comments and formatting and things like that consistent. So some of the simpler TOML libraries, like uh, the TOMLlib that's in 3.11, really just converts your TOML file into a dictionary, which loses all the information about formatting. It loses all the information about comments and things like this. So they kind of have, again, th different use cases. If, if you just need to read your TOML, then TOML lib does a fantastic job. Yeah. And if you're not on 3.11, there's also a library called Tomly, which is just, the, the, it is the same as TOML lib. Uh, they're they're kind of, they're the same library. Yeah. So Python basically adding it as a, Exactly. Sort of, yeah. Yeah, first yeah. party thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so you just need to install Toml if you're not on three eleven yet. Uh, but Toml Kit uh, brings a lot of new powers that you you, you can't really do with Tomly. So, if you have a use case where you need the Toml Kit features, then you should use it. But if you just have simple needs where you just need to read a, a Toml file, then uh, using the standard library or Tomly is, is more than enough. Were there any other reasons you wanted to mention why you brought it up, Laydoms? Oh, I guess my main reason was that this is going to be part of the build system in Python project. So this is the main reason I I wanted to to highlight this article. It's going to be a part of people's Python future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to be part of the future. And I guess it's, it's kind of something that Python is looking for to find some better system to do this. Yeah, so this deep dive is really going to get you much further into it if, if you're interested beyond just the the packaging, like kind of sort of the history and other ways that Tomal can be used. Yeah, neat. So my first one, I'm going to feature a video course. And this video course is um, not based upon an, an existing written tutorial. It's written whole cloth by Christopher Trudeau. You might have heard of him <laughs> <laughs> or literally heard him. He's the frequent co-host on the show. This one is geared again toward intermediate Python programmers. It's kind of an in-depth guide to setting up a REST API and it having all the typical CRUD operations, if you're familiar with database stuff, create, read, update, and delete, and get all that going with this package called Django Ninja. The course 
It was very interesting for uh, Christopher to present it to me because it requires a lot more uh, sort of conferring, if you will, <laughs> with him as a creator and me as a reviewer and me testing things and making sure all the details are set up. And it's a very detailed course. It, it's uh, an hour and 12 minutes, and you take a very deep dive into not only what risk APIs are and the typical endpoints you'd want to create. It talks about URL arguments and query strings, serialization, uh, using various Django sort of classes and setting up, like I mentioned, the CRUD operations, but also authentication and then error management. I'm a big fan of how you interact and set up stuff with Fast API. I'll mention it in a little bit also. And it's very popular in the Python community. And I really like the swagger elements where you generate interactive documentation and testable sort of web interfaces for the API. It doesn't require like a third-party tool to kind of get in the way there. It's just right there as you're testing it. And if you're a Django user, I think this is a really great addition if you need to create APIs and maybe want something that's a little more modern and a little more kind of fast and quick and easy to use, <laughs> uh, but you are a Django person. This is definitely in that same framework as like something like Fast API. And uh, as a note, if you would like a deep dive into the Django REST framework, Chris created one of those about a year ago, a <laughs> video course, deep diving into the Django REST framework itself. The course has all of Christopher's usual humor. <laughs> I think this time he dives deep into Game of Thrones stuff with the, the new series coming out this year. So, And uh, I want to thank Christopher for all his work this year. As a video uh, creator, it's been really great going through his courses and uh, him being a co-host over this last year. So thanks. And I think that brings us back up to Kate. What do you got? It does. And it kind of ties in nicely because if you're looking to become a Django person, yeah, we have a project for you. <laughs> this is a step-by-step -step project by Charles de Villiers called Manage Your To-Do Lists Using Python and Django. And I realized that two of the three tutorials I brought are written by people who are physics experts. So Charles uh, <laughs> teaches physics and math. <laughs> and this was his first tutorial for Real Python. And he really took a dive into the deep end. Our step-by-step -step projects are often the, the most involved. Um, not always, but they're quite involved to create because you have to really populate the materials repository with the state of the app or whatever you're building at every single step. Yeah. Um, because as Lee Adonis said earlier, we want to make sure that at the end of every single step, you have, you know, something to show for it. So I really applaud him for taking this on as his first tutorial for us. And I think that the app that you build is really cool. It allows you to keep track of all of your to-do lists and mark them as complete and kind of move them around. So it's very useful. But what really stood out to me about this tutorial is it's a basics tutorial. Like it's categorized as basics. And I'm not sure how many step-by-step -step projects we have yeah. <laughs> that are basics. Um, and I was looking at the comments and saw where somebody said, I never understood virtual environments until doing this tutorial. Oh, nice. So at RealPython, we have this idea of, you know, we want our readers to be able to go from zero to hero. And I feel like that mission is totally embodied, like in this one tutorial. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it can be your first Django project. You're going to learn all the basics of Django. You're going to learn about data models, templates, class-based views for standard database operations, URL configurations, um, how to make your web app secure after development. So you really get this full overview of what you can do to build a basic Django app. And then at the end, um, in our step-by-step -step tutorials, we always have uh, next steps. Yeah. <laughs> so you could start with this, and then honestly, it could be like the thing that launches you into your whole Django journey. So I think that's really exciting. It seems like a great way in to this super popular library for web development. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm excited about it because it's a little different than the uh, very common starting point 
which is to build a blog. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think this is kind of u- useful because you're seeing this additional functionality of what Django can be used for. And Django has been used for so many different types of projects. So Yeah. And you could get very meta and make your Django app and then use it as your to-do list of ways that you're going <laughs> to build that Django app. This go. could be where you keep your learning path. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Garano, what's your next one? Uh, yeah, next one I want to uh, showcase is one of Leodonis's articles. Uh, All right. <laughs> so there, uh, yeah, as always with Leodonis, there's tons of different articles to choose from. He is by far our most prolific author, so there's always uh, good stuff to choose there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the one I'm highlighting here is called Python Constants, Improve Your Code's Maintainability. And kind of want to show this as an example of of more our say classical uh, real python articles where we do a really deep dive exploration of a very uh, small topic i guess we, we could argue that constants do not even exist in python uh, and still we're able to write uh, quite a lot about them and i guess to be a little bit more precise uh, constants are essentially variables that don't change their value so they don't vary and uh, python doesn't really have um, any special support for constants like you may find in other languages. Yeah. yeah. So typically what we do in Python instead is kind of use conventions like uh, use uppercase letters and things like this to to just show everyone else that this value is meant to be a constant. And what Diglodonis does is, in this article is kind of go through a little bit why are uh, constants uh, yeah, useful to kind of be conscious of and have in your code. So it kind of points out things like uh, you, you get a lot of readability just by spelling out in words, instead of using special values, you can show the intent of your code seemingly on the, in the same way. You get more maintainability because you kind of collect your your magic numbers in one place. You it helps you avoid errors. You get simpler debugging. There's kind of all of these things that are that are useful just by being conscious of is this thing a constant or not. Kind of uh, looking through this, we get a lot of also practical tips then about how, how can you work with your constants where, where where should you save or store your constants should they kind of be just at the top of your current file you're working in or does it make sense to kind of scale out and have a separate module for mm. for constants or to kind of move back to our, our previous discussion maybe even have a config file you can throw your constants into a tumble file or things things like this yeah then towards the end of the article, uh, Ledonis also shows a few ways where you get uh, a little bit of help from the language in, in trying to keep things uh, from changing. And essentially everything in Python, you, you can always find ways to shoot yourself in the foot if you really try to. <laughs> uh, but, but these things at least give you a little bit more protection. So it kind of shows how you can typically then wrap your constants inside of a class is usually a good way then to... To, to make it harder to change. So, so you can use things like slots, which are sp- special attributes on, on classes or properties. You can use a name tuple uh, and so on to kind of to kind of make your constants a little bit safer than they're there. So, so all in all, it's kind of a great overview of, as I said, a, a topic that almost doesn't even exist in Python. <laughs> uh, so it's, a, it's yeah. a beautiful article like this. Cool. This next one that you're going to talk about, Lay It On Us, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, Darren Jones, who I'm going to talk about here in a minute, created a really great video course about it. So I might chime in as you go. <laughs> but what's your next one here? Oh, my, my next one is, is an article by Martin Bruce, one of our core content creator. The name of the article is Build Your Python Project Documentation with MK Docs. MK Docs is a Python package which is available on PyPI. You can pip install the package. And you can combine it with other packages like MK Doc String to build a project documentation, basically. Yeah. This is another uh, step by step project. And Martin guides the reader through the, the whole process of uh, starting with a Python project. He uses a basic uh, sample project with a few functions that perform some math operation. Yeah, it's like a real simple calculator kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a calculator. And uh, he writes some markdown files as a documentation for the project and also adds some doc string for these, these functions and for the modules and for the packages. And uh, with using MK Docs, he kind of builds 
the documentation for this project using the doc strings and also the markdown files that he wrote for documenting the the application. This article has is is intended to be useful for a Python developer that, for example, has just finished a project and is looking for a tool for building the project documentation. And I guess that MK Doc is a very good uh, tool for this. It it allows you to create modern and good looking static sites for for the documentation. It's basically a, a static site generator. You can then get this this static site and publish it to maybe GitHub pages or something like that, depending on your needs and and the, the scope of your project and the resources you have available. But if you are deploying or publishing a, an open source uh, library or project or application, you can perfectly use uh, GitHub pages to publish the the documentation of your project. Yeah, it's super, super common now. I see it all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, great. Martin goes through the whole process of creating the documentation. First, he kind of set up the environment for working with MK Docs and and the plugins that you need to scan the doc strings from the code. He goes through through the building process. I mean, how you you can use MK Doc to build the documentation from the markdown files and also from the doc strings. And finally, he he ended up making an exercise of how you you can publish these two uh, GitHub pages. One of the most valuable uh, topics that Martin covers in this article is that he kind of helped you or guide you through organizing your, your project documentation. He kind of suggests that you, you should uh, split the, the documentation into tutorials, how-to guides, references, and explanations, which are different kind of, of materials of, or resources that you can provide to your users for them to use your project or your code in a better way. I guess that documentation is, is one of these fundamental topics in programming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you can have the best project in the world. You can have a nice and elegant and robust code. If your project doesn't have a good documentation, your project it's not going to be good. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of... It's going to be hard for people to start implementing it and use it. Yeah, and developers love coding and creating things in code, but sometimes they don't uh, like, you know, documenting their code. I think they it's kind of like this weird double-edged thing where they, they sure like it when it's w- well done, you know, like I hear people complain about Apple's documentation for like the Swift libraries, people just constantly kind of complaining about them. But at the same time, as a developer yourself, you you need to be documenting your own stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And basically your code, who is going to write the, the doc string for your functions on classes? You have to do it. <laughs> so this is, this is basic, uh, you know, best practice in programming. I know writing documentation is hard and keeping the documentation up to date is even harder. So I guess that um, MK Docs is a great helper in this task. Yeah. Martin did a great job in showcasing all the features that this tool has and how you can, you can use it to build good documentation for your projects. Yeah. Yeah. I was tempted to, uh, when we first were selecting to select the video course that it's based on, uh, or that is based on it, that's by Darren Jones, because I really enjoyed kind of reviewing it and going through it. And um, so if you're interested, we have both the video course or the the step-by-step project. Once you see it in action, it's one of these things where you might have been hesitating or been nervous about, oh my gosh, I got to write documentation. Yeah. (laughs) This might be the the thing that helps you get over that hump. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, this tool. One of the most interesting features is that you can use the doc strings from your code. Uh, it kind of automate the process of extracting those yeah. doc strings and creating the appropriate documentation for for every function, every class, or every package you have. So it's kind of we are writing the documentation only once. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> or updating it too, right? Yeah, yeah. You write the doc strings, and then you use MK Docs and the write plugins, and you can 
reuse these doc strings and these Go documentation. Yep. Awesome. Well, my next one is by Darren Jones. It's a, a video course, and it's based on a step-by-step project by Philip Eskinney. And it is building a URL shortener, uh, another project, <laughs> with Fast API and Python. Darren joined the Real Python team about the same time as myself. It's kind of funny. We have really similar backgrounds. We joke as being sort of doppelgangers. <laughs> um, he lives in London and is like totally into music production and music technology education. That's his background. Here we are speaking of APIs and fast API. You're going to build a URL shortener. So I'm sure you've come across URLs that are gargantuan and you've wanted a way to make them small. Maybe you're familiar with bit.ly, bit.ly or something like that. This helps you create something like that. It's another fairly long course. It's an hour and like seven minutes. The things you're going to do is create a REST API with Fast API, but you also learn how to set up a development web server using a tool called UVCorn. Along with that, you are modeling a SQLite database and investigating auto-generated API documentation. So again, those tools like Swagger that are part of Fast API, you get to explore some of that again. Interact with the database, again, using CRUD type actions. One of the steps that I really liked in the original article and then in this course is that he goes through a whole bunch of refactoring and optimization steps, which I think are really nice. I think I championed the article when it came out, when Philip had written it and uh, talked about it on the podcast earlier. But uh, Darren did a, a workman job of putting this together and including his typical dry humor. (laughs) (laughs) Again, Darren, thanks for all the work this year. You've done a great job. Both Christopher and Darren are like my two sort of outside people that are not part of the core team, but are constantly creating video courses and helping out with the team. And I want to thank them. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It's titled Building Python Project Documentation with MK Docs. The course is based on a real Python step-by-step project by frequent guest Martin Broyce. And in the video course, instructor Darren Jones shows you how to work with MK Docs to produce static pages from Markdown, pull in code documentation from docstrings using MK Doc strings, follow best practices for project documentation, and use the material for MK Docs theme to make your documentation look great, and how to host your documentation on GitHub pages. I think using tools like this can make what seems like a daunting task so much easier. And I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how to automate production of your project's documentation. Your users will truly appreciate it. Real Python video courses are broken into easily consumable sections and where needed, include code examples for the technique shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. Kate, what's your last one? Yeah, so my last one is called Image Processing with the Python Pillow Library. It's by another physicist, Stephen Grappetta. What? Um, (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Who left a career in physics to found Code Today, which is a platform that teaches kids how to code. He's also working on the Python coding book, an interactive online book that walks you through learning how to think like a computer as you start your programming journey. So this tutorial was so much fun to work on. And honestly, like you should pause the podcast and just go find it and scroll through it because it's one of those things where a picture (laughs) is worth a thousand words and I didn't count the pictures in this, but there are a ton. (laughs) (laughs) So you can very quickly see like, oh, cool, that's what I'll be doing. I'll be putting a cat in a monastery. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, creating animations and all these things that, that I certainly had never really thought about using Python to do. So it's great for an intermediate Python programmer especially one who hasn't used Python to work with images before, because the Pillow library is, you know, it doesn't require advanced image processing expertise. There's not a steep learning curve like there is with other libraries, many of which are built on Pillow. Yeah. But it still gives you the capabilities that you would find in, say, Photoshop. It's a really neat library. This tutorial really puts it through its paces. You will... 
you know, learn how to read images with pillow, perform basic image manipulation operations. You'll learn about pixels and kernels and different color modes. You'll also, when you want to do things that pillow can't do on its own, you'll bring in NumPy for reinforcements. Uh, And like I said, you can even make animations. So it's a really, really neat tutorial. And you'll have a lot to show for it yeah. <laughs> at every step along the way because you're going to mm. be manipulating these images, blurring them, flipping them, just playing with them. And the images are all provided for you. And that's one thing I did want to mention uh, that came to my mind about changes that have happened at Real Python in the past year. So our tutorials always have what we call an opt-in which is where you can get a little extra bonus. And with our step-by-step projects and you know tutorials like this where you're working with provided images, we've always provided these custom opt-ins where we have materials that are hosted on GitHub and you can download them and then you're ready to go and work through the tutorial. But a recent change is that we're starting to provide that on all of our tutorials. So Sometimes, you know, even if you have a really in-depth tutorial, there's still some information that kind of got left on the cutting room floor that we didn't have room to go into. So now you can, you'll often like get these bonus materials where you can get an even deeper dive into the topic than what you're getting in the tutorial itself. So yeah, be be on the lookout for that. You can often download really cool stuff from our tutorials. Yeah, that process has gotten so much easier. Yeah. Um, and I think Martin and Ian and a couple different people on the team have been sort of championing that idea. Mm-hmm. And uh, I appreciate it uh, as somebody who reviews a lot of the stuff for the show and talk about it on the shows I do with Christopher. It used to be, you know, kind of a bit of navigating mm-hmm. <laughs> inside of our, our large GitHub repository. And now to have it broken out as like individual zip files, kind of the way like our video courses are, it's been really nice. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, Garrett, what's your next one? Uh, yeah. So I'm going to continue a little bit on what Kate was talking about with Pillow. Okay. And talk a little bit more about uh, images. And before kind of moving on to my article, I'll also just mention that I follow Stephen, Stephen Grappetta on Twitter, and he has a really nice uh, threads there where he's showing off a lot of animations and things that he does. A lot of it, I think, is related to the work he does with coding with kids. Yeah. Uh, but Yeah, a lot of turtle stuff, right? Mm. Right. Up to, lots of turtles and and does amazing stuff in Turtle, the library that I didn't know was possible with Turtles. <laughs> so that, that's a hot tip as well. Just fo- follow Stephen on Twitter. But yeah, my article is written um, by uh, one of our core members, uh, Bartosz uh, Saksinski, and um, it's using Pillow to draw fractals. So, so the article is called Draw the Mandelbrot Set in Python. And I kind of want to highlight this mostly to, to just be, be able to sit here and talk about one of my personal nerd loves uh, of fractals, <laughs> okay. but also because it is a really nice article. So my, my personal history is essentially that I, I studied mathematics at the university and I wrote uh, my master's thesis was about fractals. So when Bartosz was starting working on this article, I, I raised my hand quite visibly and said that I, I definitely want to join in and, and review this. Yeah. So, so I got to play a little bit around with him on this. Bartosz is also one of the people that's been around for a long time uh, on the team. He's kind of similar to Leodonis in that he's really good at going in-depth uh, with his articles. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Well, Leodonis kind of goes in-depth on small topics. Uh, Bartosz tends to go in-depth on huge topics. <laughs> so it kind of just um, grows in all directions. So it, it's a lot of fun to kind of f- follow these things and... and I think what we often do with Bartos' articles is kind of split them up into more articles. And and those articles, again, have new babies and so on. So it's kind of <laughs> always some new, new things coming there. And this particular one is actually split off from an article he wrote, I think that was probably last year, about complex numbers. Yeah. And uh, fractals are kind of uh, something that the math behind fractals kind of lives in, inside of this complex number space. So... If you're not that much into math and haven't heard about these complex numbers, you can kind of think of them just as as a way to to describe points in a plane. So if you have something that's on a 2D, two-dimensional, say a sheet of paper or something like this, mm-hmm. it gives you one number to describe any point there. Instead of having all, all the numbers on the line, they're kind of in a plane instead. 
these fractals that we're talking about, th these are just geometric shapes that can have details at arbitrarily small scales, is of what we call it. So, so what it means is that you can zoom into them and, and discover new things. These come in a couple of different uh, forms. So I guess to, to kind of get an idea, I can also just mention that what, what are not fractals. So, so typically say a circle is not a fractal because once you kind of zoom into the circle it's just your, your line that's there there's no new detail to, that's hiding in there or squares are not fractals while if we think kind of in the real world a typical kind of example that's at least uh, fractal like in in nature is uh, our coastlines yeah so if you look at the world map especially here in norway where i am and uh, we have a lot of coastline uh, but if you look at the world map it kind of seems like we don't have that much in a sense, but once you start zooming in, you'll see that there are all of these fjords and there's islands and things like this. There's lots of new details popping up. And then if you actually go to the beach, you'll kind of see that, well, there's small rocks and things like this. So you can kind of keep zooming into this and, and, and learn new stuff about it. So that's kind of the main idea about fractals. So this article is about probably, or not even probably, it is about the most famous fractal out there, uh, which is called the Mandelbrot set. And this is named by after a person uh, called Benoit uh, Mandelbrot, who, who kind of discovered this, uh, this fractal when he was playing on his computer, I think back in the early 80s. And at this time, yeah, the computing power was so vastly different from what we have today. Uh, so today the Mandelbrot set is often used to kind of demo performance because it is it is a very nice parallelizable problem to kind of draw these things. But back in the 80s, it, it would take hours to just render and anything that looked a little bit like uh, the detail we're able to get today. So, so he, he, he was kind of just doing a very simple mathematical process on his computer and somehow this fancy image came out of it. And, and the process the Mandelbrot set is based on is just squaring numbers. So uh, now, now I'm going to do the, the great exercise of, uh, of talking about these very visual images on, on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so just close your eyes and, and imagine this now. Uh, but essentially, if you, if you think about, uh, start just with, with a regular number. So let's start with zero. And, and then you can square your number and then you have a fixed number that you add to it. So I start zero squared. That's just zero times zero. So that's still zero. And then let's plus one to this number. Uh, then I get one and then I take one squared, which is still one. And I add one to this. So then I get two. Then I take two squared, which is four. I add one, so I have five. Five squared is 25 and so on. And what you can notice there is just the numbers keep increasing and, and they'll kind of uh, increase extremely fast. Now, other numbers, we can kind of do the same exercise and, and get different behavior from. So if we, instead of adding one, we subtract one to this, then I'll kind of have zero squared minus one is negative one. Negative one squared is plus one, which I can subtract one from and I get zero. And then I kind of go in this cycle like this. So what the Mandelbrot set is, it's just a description of which points, which numbers uh, that go to infinity, rush off to infinity, and which are kind of stuck in this kind of cycle. So it seems like a fairly simple process, and it, it's definitely something that you can just code up in a few a few lines of code. But somehow all of this fantastic image kind of comes out of it. If you've kind of seen the Mandelbrot set, it is this uh, weird little shape of circles, a shape that almost looks like a Buddha lying on its side, and it has these kind of tentacles sticking out of it. The typical demonstration that you do is that you can zoom into this and then you find all these new details and somewhere in there is kind of a new yeah. Mandelbrot set almost hiding in it and, and so on. So, so it's it's a really cool thing to to explore. Creates awesome artwork. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so back to the article, what Bartosz is exploring in it is kind of giving you a little bit of information about what is the Mandelbrot set, kind of describing what I've done and with the images, which is probably more helpful than in audio. But then, as I mentioned, often the Mandelbrot set is used to kind of demonstrate performance. So you, you might have seen demos where you can kind of code this up. Look, this code takes forever to run, but now you can run it in NumPy and it runs much faster, things like this. Bartosz touches this a little bit in the article, but it, it, that's not the point of this article. This article is all about the, the visualizations. And, uh, and there's lots of cool little tricks to do that make the visualizations look much nicer. Yeah. Uh, that, that's really where it's kind of starting off with just, okay, let's just draw this line or just a black-white plot in Matplotlib, but then it kind of moves on to actually use a pillow that Kate was talking about and, and kind of smooth things out. And we get something really 
really nice pictures and we can kind of change the color maps and change how things are drawn and and so on so so it's it's a really nice article for people who are a little bit interested in math is probably good since there is math in this article yeah but it's really a nice showcase of how can you work with different kind of visualizations in python and how to really work then with the pillar library in general yeah tons of great um, not only images in are obvious or code segments mm. but then he also has a bunch of animations that he's recorded as videos that are in there yeah. so yeah you can just kind of look over it and very quickly see if you're interested in learning more it's very fascinating mm. uh, actually one of the first articles of the year it came out in january yep yeah awesome so late on us you were going to talk about your next one my last one is mostly a rewrite for an old article about beep PIP is the Python package manager. So probably you have heard about PIP. The article is titled Using Python's PIP to Manage Your Project Dependencies. And it's written by Philip Axkani. Philip is one of our core team members. He's working on articles and video courses. And I guess he's kind of our font guru or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> expert at real Python. The article is, basically, I, I wanted to highlight this article because it covers a topic that I guess is fundamental in, in Python. Yeah. I mean, if you are starting with Python, you probably will have to learn some things about PIP because it's the, the first tool that you will use to install packages and, and manage your, your dependencies in every, in any project. Yeah, we talk so much about how how much there is built into Python, the sort of batteries included. Yeah. But mm -hmm. every article that we've mentioned so far has included <laughs> so many outside packages. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some alternatives uh, to to PIP, but I guess as a Python developer, PIP is a must-have skill. The article, it goes into installing and setting up PIP Basically, PIP comes with a standard installation from Python 3.4. So you can you can select if you want to install or not. In I guess in, in on Windows and Mac, you can you can select if if you you would like to install PIP or not. But uh, I guess it it is checked by default. So yeah, you probably have the tool available from your Python installation, and you can use to install and also to uninstall Python packages. By default, pip install packages from the Python package index, also known as PyPI. But uh, you can set some configurations just to change the package index you want to use. This is a very nice feature that, for example, some companies has internal package indexes and you can if you work in, in some of these companies, you, you can change the PIP index so you can install the, the package from the internal index. It is also possible to, to install packages from GitHub repositories or repos. And the article covers all these topics. It also covers how to uninstall packages, which is, which is um, an uncommon topic in, yeah. in PIP. Because in Python, if you are going to start a project, you, you typically create a virtual environment. And since virtual environments are kind of a temporary setup for working with Python, it is kind of nonsense to uninstall packages. It's just, just uh, I mean, it is easier to create a new virtual environment, a clean virtual environment, and to install the dependencies of your project. Yeah, the one time I can think of that being crucial is the time that you didn't activate your environment <laughs> and you <Yeah. laughs> installed. <laughs> and you uh, accidentally installed the package yeah, so, on your system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, then you may want to be doing the uninstall. Yeah, <laughs> you may. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, that's that's uh, a good use case for uninstalling packages with beep. The final part of the article covers how to use uh, requirement files for automatically managing the dependencies of a given project with pip these files are kind of a list of dependencies for your project 
and you can have a file for development or even for production. For example, at the development stages, you typically use things like PyTest for running your test or Black for, for mounting the code. But these tools, you don't use these tools in production. You, you just use the core dependencies of your project in production. So you, you can have, for example, a requirement file for development and a requirement file for production. And Philip does a great job of explaining how to do this and how to configure this requirement file for projects and, and how to set up the right list of dependencies, the versions, how to, hand, how to handle the versions of, of every package on your list of dependencies and uh, many other details about this. It's a great article for those readers that are starting with Python. Yeah. Because at the end, you, you're going to be using PIP at some point of, of the process, you know? And that's why I, I was desiring to showcase this article because I, I guess PIP is a fundamental tool in the Python ecosystem. It's such a thing that's, it's like this unwritten thing that you yeah, yeah. need to know and people just are, and tutorials are often just like, <laughs> all right, just use this thing. And it's like, w- what does it do? <laughs> yeah. You have also, as, as, as I said before, you have some alternatives like Conda or Poetry or PIPM, but uh, PIP is in the core of the language. I mean, it's, ca- it's kind of the default package manager. So <laughs> It's going to be in your way. <laughs> so if you're beginning with Python, go for this article and learn a bit about Beep. Yeah. I was kind of scrolling through it as you were talking, and something that Kate had highlighted early on is this sort of thing where we have the Windows for the command prompts and the Linux and Mac OS commands and so forth. And this really takes advantage of that throughout because it's you know, one of those things you're going to be using at the command prompt, and very often it can be a little different depending on uh, your operating system there. So really taking advantage of that resource. Cool. Great. My next one is actually kind of diving into that idea that I mentioned near the beginning of this conversation, which is the idea of these code conversations. I highlighted one a couple weeks ago, the one with Gerarna and Ian about PyProject Toml. This is one of the first ones that ever came out. This one is from Martin Broyce, and it's called Exploring Scopes and Closures in Python. And it's kind of odd to call it a conversation because it's mainly just him. <laughs> <laughs> so most of the other ones that we have are sort of a back and forth with two people. And uh, please check them out. There's a whole bunch there. But I did like this one a lot. Uh, I feel like I wanted to highlight it. Uh, it's called Exploring Scopes and Closures in Python. It's based on a question that Martin had found on Stack Overflow. And he had found an answer by Martin Peters. It explained a lot of the concepts in the paragraph that's there. But Martin decided, you know what, this would be great to show visually and do kind of it in a conversational style. And he uses the Thony editor, T-H-O-N-N-Y, which is a common, I like to call it a simple IDE. It's, you know, it's a lot of beginners use it. Uh, it has its kind of its own package management thing built into it. But one of the features it has that's really nice is the way it does debugging. And Martin takes you through using the Thony debugger to walk through the sample code. And as he enters the different functions and goes deeper in scope-wise and inspects these different things, you start to see the relationship very, very visually. And it's great. I thought it was a really great way of kind of highlighting and showing kind of what we can do as a video course that is maybe a little harder to do in a written course. And so it's this sort of deep dive into the inner workings of Python by inspecting dunder objects. And it's a great brush up on scope and the concept of namespaces and a lot more. It's definitely an intermediate one. But I want to end uh, by doing a shout out to the whole core team that's been working on the Python basics courses. So uh, just to kind of give people some real great content over the last year, Python basics book that Real Python put out that David Amos was very instrumental in helping to write. He had started with the very first course last year and over the following year, this year, 
Martin and Ian and Philip, people that we've mentioned a bunch, and Bartage, have followed up with additional courses along with myself. And we've built out quite a bit of the learning path so far. I think there's nine items on there. And probably by the time you see this, there'll be 10 uh, items. And there's quizzes that Kate has added (laughs) and a lot of other additional content. So if you're on your Python basic journey trying to get started here, it's a really great resource. And I'll definitely include a link to that learning path. You can check out all of the different links inside there as far as getting started with Python with video courses. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming on the show. This has been fantastic. Thanks, Kate, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Hey, Laidonis, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Chris. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Garana, thanks for coming back. It's good to talk to you again. Yeah, likewise. It's always fun to be here. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Well, thanks for all of everybody's work at Real Python this last year. And uh, thanks to all the listeners that we've added in the last year. Thanks for listening. And don't forget, try out full stack observability for free with Telemetry Hub. Get complex data visualization and analysis to give your team the diagnostic tools needed to identify and resolve issues within your environment. I want to thank Kate Finnegan, Garana Hiela, and Leodanas Pozo Ramos for joining me this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.